Okay, looks like we are live six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so um, first podcast, exercises, medicine um, podcast. I have a couple guests with me today. First off, uh, I'll introduce myself last, but um, Nicholas, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Nick. Um, I'm an exercise, excuse me, health sciences student here at Drexel. I am a senior now. Um, I was in the military for four years as a paramedic and uh, I'm studying towards, um, hope to get my doctor of osteopathy and become a physical med and rehab uh, doctor. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Steve. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Beatty. I am an assistant teaching professor uh, in the Department of Health Sciences at Drexel University. In fact, this is my first year at Drexel and I'm looking forward to hopefully having a nice long career working with you, Dr. Bruno. Perfect segue. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Steve and Nick. Uh, my name is Mike Bruno. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Sciences. I've been at Drexel since 2016. Um, and I started exercises medicine at Drexel. So did it collaboratively, um, been involved with the exercise science minor and will be the president elect for the mid Atlantic ACSM organization, which is the mid Atlantic chapters, uh, version of the ACSM, which is part of the larger national ACSM. So, um, I think part of what this podcast is really designed to do is a couple of things. I think maybe I should start by talking a little bit about what is exercise as medicine and why we decided to create it in the first place. And then uh, we'll get into some of the specific goals and initiatives that we think might be helpful for students, faculty, and staff at Drexel. And then talk a little bit about a topic that I think could be helpful for people, which would be why is it important to exercise? What are the recommendations? And then how might we start to go about doing it? Okay. I think those are the three primary goals for this. So, um, in 2010, the American college of sports medicine created, uh, I believe at it's 54th annual meeting in Baltimore decided to come out with an exercises medicine initiative. Okay. Uh, there was a book that came out about exercise as medicine. And since then, over the last now 11 years, the college has made an impact to try to have physical activity as a vital sign in health. Okay. We know that there are numerous health and fitness benefits of becoming more physically active. And it really is sort of the universal pill that really serves as a panacea for a lot of different things. Okay. So um, the college sort of started this at the ACSM annual meeting in Baltimore in 2010. And since then has grown the program to create exercises, medicine campuses. Okay. Um, doesn't really take much effort to have an exercises, medicine campus. You have to have an academic professor to spearhead the effort. You have to have a student representative who um, can make sure that the student voice in what the students want is well represented on the exercises medicine platform. You have to have a clinician and you have to have some kind of a health professional. So that could be a personal trainer. That could be somebody running a, um, a fitness facility. You need to have those members of the team in order to qualify for exercises medicine status. Um, so that is like the, the overall mission statement of EIM to the best of my knowledge, how I can articulate it. Um, Steve, do you have any, updates on this. I know that you were involved with this at uh, University of Illinois Springfield before coming to Drexel, but does that pretty much summarize it? No, I think you did a really good job at summarizing what exercise as medicine is. It's an initiative to uh, encourage uh, people to be more physically active. Okay. Um, so really why we wanted to do this is I think to now get into, well, why should we care about exercise as medicine? And whether you're a student, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're a staff member, um, Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe how physical activity and exercise, like how did you get into yeah. physically active? How did you get into a, a, um, how, how did you get into exercise and weightlifting and, and why is it important to you? Yeah. First off, uh, thanks Mike for bringing me on as the uh, student representative for exercises medicine. 
Um, so my personal experience with exercise, it started around uh, late high school. I wasn't a very active person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in order to actually pay for college, I was considering doing an ROTC program. And there were obviously some physical requirements for that. So, you know, I just did, you know, basic sit-ups, push-ups, you know, um, some basic running, uh, no real like kind of coordination until I kind of got more into like a regimented program that I found online. Um, it actually was like really cathartic. Um, my stress level was going down. My confidence was going up. I started to look better, started to feel better. And then uh, I went to Drexel in 2014 to um, kind of get involved in not quite sure what I wanted to do particularly. Mm. And, uh, you know, kind of wanted to find myself. So I actually left Drexel for a little bit. And then, then I, uh, I joined the military for uh, four years um, as a paramedic. I learned a lot about medicine. I worked with athletic trainers um, in my unit, uh, just kind of started to practice a little bit more weight training. I learned, obviously, you, you do cardio nearly every day there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's always been something that stuck with me. And uh, I kind of, and with that, you know, there's a lot of uh, health benefits, you know. Um, I guess because it's such an easily swallowable, you know, proverbial pill, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I feel like it could help people in not only the facets that I was, you know, um, able to see myself, but also, you know, bring people out of a lot of, uh, you know, clinical issues as well. So it's something I'm very passionate about and, you know, it's something I feel like any, everyone can do nearly. Thank you for that. Steve? Uh, yeah, my, my, uh, my forte exercise, a bit non-traditional, uh, being a young uh, punk rocker from New Jersey and, and uh, hanging around subcultures uh, like Nick. I was a bit uh, of a late bloomer. I never really exercised in high school. And it wasn't until um, after high school where, uh, I, you know, I, I had smoked for a long time. Uh, I had quit smoking cold turkey, uh, basically not so much off a dare, but one of my friends who, who I looked up to, who was older, uh, basically said that uh, I was incapable of quitting smoking. That uh, you know I was, I was, I was, you know, I was a basically, you know, I was, I was at the mercy of cigarettes, and I had absolutely no willpower. So I had, I had immediately, subsequently quit smoking, and uh, my life being the the series of extremes uh, that it has been, I uh, started going to the gym. Um, and then shortly after that, I found uh, combat sports, specifically Muay Thai, and got very, very uh, um, um, into traditional Muay Thai, and then started competing. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. And then, I, you know, I, um, I, I found uh, the clinical application of exercise, you know, exercise being a very potent non-pharmacological intervention. Uh, and as you had kind of uh, stated uh, at, in the introduction, uh, exercise being somewhat of a panacea for many of, uh, you know, uh, the metabolic disorders that, that you know, plague uh, uh, the United States, the world, really. Uh, and then now, uh, as I was uh, 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 telling Nick, uh, you know, uh, I, I love exercise and I love exploring physiology through the lens of exercise. So that's my, my short version. Very cool. Very How cool. about you, Mike? Well, for me, it's been a long road. You know, I think um, growing up, I, I was always a heavy kid. I think I had a size 32 waist when I was in like kindergarten. I know that's kind of funny to, <laughs> to think about, but I think it, I'm not yours joking. Is, I, I feel like I was like 100. Something with the number 32 definitely sticks out. So either I was like 132 pounds by the time I was in like first or second grade. I think the term something. is a uh, husky. I was yeah. husky for sure in my whole life. And, and I've, always, I've always sort of oscillated up and down. But um, I would say that the f the first wave of when I really started to turn the corner and sort of like in three phases, and I would consider the jujitsu to be the third phase. The first phase mm -hmm. was sort of where I kind of said, all right, um, we need to like start becoming more physically active because to a certain degree, I can't control. I was not, I love my parents very much, but I was never able to control what they put in front of me and eat every single night for dinner, right? Like I don't buy the groceries. I don't really have much of a say in terms of what was put in front of me and what they cook for dinner. So, um, and my grandfather used to always tell me that you have to clean your plate. Like there's starving people. You need to be able to clean your plate and we're not throwing any food away. So, um, I kind of got into this, this habit of always eating and eating more than I would need to. 
And so um, the first wave happened in high school when um, I was doing a strength and conditioning program, off-season program for high school. I played football at Naugatuck High School. And um, there was like, the coach basically came to me and said, you um, are a great athlete, but like there's juniors and seniors who are going to be able to play defensive end and defensive linemen. And so um, if you want to play varsity next year, you basically need to lose weight. And so uh, I subsequently lost 42 pounds over the course of that off season. I was very out of shape. I couldn't oh. run hills, couldn't run um, stadiums in any, any, any type of way that was meaningful. I was struggling. I was almost vomiting every time I would try and do the conditioning programs. And I realized it wasn't working. So, um, I just went on this very strict, very basic habitual thing. Like couldn't count calories. I know that's recommended mathematically, but I knew that in order to lose the weight, I needed to do something that was going to work with my lifestyle. So I said, all right, well, if I just stop eating in between meals and I just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I eat good stuff, um, and I just keep it simple, like the same thing, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, like the same breakfast, and then lunch will be the same kind of lunch and the same kind of dinner. Like that'll like eliminate a lot of the decisions that I have to make eating eating late at night. So what ended up happening was um, I started be, you know, losing a lot of fat weight, increasing a lot of muscle weight. And uh, in that off season, when I came out for spring ball, I started the season at 242 pounds when I was a freshman in high school, I remember that number because I was 195 by the time I came out for spring ball mm -hmm. and uh, I played fullback, I played inside linebacker and then eventually they actually did have me put my hand on the ground and went back to defensive end because I was fast and I could hit the corner hard. So uh, that was like the first wave and then as my life sort of continued to progress, junior and senior level of high school, um, I sort of like had to like beef up and like now those people that were defensive ends and defensive linemen now graduated. So I beefed back up to about 225 to 230, um, mostly muscle, I will say, mostly muscle, and uh, played defensive nose tackle uh, my junior and senior year, actually mostly senior year. Then I went to college and I got into like phase two, which was sort of like the the bodybuilding and the powerlifting years. Cause I didn't have to play football as much. I played, did play at central Connecticut state university, um, for a short term. Then I transitioned focused mostly on my studies, but I always loved the off season lifting. So what I did is I said, okay, well maybe I can just like make this a sport at the same time. Um, you know, I was, this is the, when I was probably at my strongest. I had a bench press of 585 pounds. I had a 780 pound squat, uh, like a 325 clean. Like it was legitimate powerlifting. And yeah. um, I can't lift that anymore. <laughs> I will say that <laughs> I'm when, coming we, for you. when we lifted in grad school together, Mike was repping 8 to 10 with 345s on each side. There's no exaggeration. Of what? Of what exercise? A squat. Squat? Yeah. I mean... 345 oh that's 315 yeah yeah so it was pretty good at the time i was i mean i was surprised because i wasn't lifting seriously like i was in the past um so the long story of all this was after when i was in college i started doing power lifting and then my grandmother um was like yeah i think you're putting too much pressure on your heart you know constantly doing the volsava maneuver with heavy weights and so she's like you know you get an echocardiogram then i went to Yukon after that and I started doing more cycling activity. Okay. Well, you know, how do I lose some more of this weight now that I was at two thirty? I don't need to be two thirty anymore. Yeah. So what ended up happening from there is during graduate school, Steve can tell you this, it's a super stressful time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you have to sacrifice usually not enough hours in the day for everything. You know, do I want to study and prepare for this exam or do I want to go work out? Um, fortunately when I was in, uh, my PhD program, Steve was a master's student at the same school. So we became friends ever since then. And, um, so that was sort of like sporadic. I was like exercising, but I wasn't really exercising. I was trying to play temptation bundling, like study while I'm like on the treadmill and yeah, all these different prioritizing things. Prioritizing really. Yeah. And it, at the end of the day, like I went to Drexel and I actually ballooned. I don't know if I ever told you this. 
um, when I was at my heaviest, I was probably close to 280 pounds. No. Yeah. Really? I was probably close to 280 pounds almost when I was, that was probably two years into Drexel. Yeah. I wasn't really exercising. Right. Um, I was working a lot. I was being, I was successful. I had a lot of good things going for me. And then finally I was just kind of like, all right, how do I, I realize that like I should be exercising. I'm an advocate. I don't want to be a statistic. Right. So I didn't have any health problems, like no high blood pressure, nothing like that. But ultimately what made me do it was I was always a fan of mixed martial arts. And you know, my favorite fighter. Habib Nurmagomedov, right? Smash. Retired, right? <laughs> so uh, I was loved watching. I was like, man, I wish I can control people like Khabib. And so uh, I actually called Steve up. We had Zoom coffees before they were cool. And um, not cool, but before out of they necessity. they were mandatory. Right? No, they were mandatory. But like <laughs> no, we were doing man. this long, long before um, when he moved to Illinois. And, and even when he was living in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. in uh, Enfield. And what ended up happening is... I just signed up at Balance Studios here in, in Philadelphia. So Phil and Rick Miglaris, um, Steve knew them because Frankie Edgar, who's mm-hmm. a big USC fighter, um, trained with Phil and Rick for a while when you were at Rhino Fight Club, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the connection. So then I trained there. Um, they accepted me. They were super cool. And I said, all right, I'm just going to come and do this once. I'm going to come and just do the basics class. And then that, I got bit by the, what's called the jujitsu bug and then you become part of the lifestyle where you start wearing Phil Migler's <laughs> t-shirts and it is, it's, it's very, very intoxicating. Then. So now that's where I'm at now. And I'm down 35 pounds, 35 or 40 pounds since then. So, you know, I'm back in like the two forties now, two forty two. I think I'm back. So that's where I'm at. And that's how I got into exercise. But, uh, it's been, a, it's been a wave. It's been up and down and I haven't, you know, it's been struggles, but I had to, uh, I had to do something to take control of my life before my life controlled me. So, at either rate, that's kind of how um, how it all happened. But um, I don't know if either of you have anything else you want to talk about with respect to that. If I can expound uh, upon your the graduate experience, our graduate experience, and how you kind of said that you know when you get to graduate school, it's it's, it's extremely busy and and uh, it's it's kind of a can. And I know this is a this is a, a common saying in med school. It's like drinking. Uh, out of a fire hose, you're you're given so yeah. much, and you're expected to take it all in. Uh, but graduate school was it, this is it's the perfect kind of frame for what we're discussing. It's about making time. It's, it's about seeing the importance of exercise, not just uh, physically the physical benefits, but the mental benefits and making mm-hmm. time in your life. And I think a big inspiration for me was Dr. Headley. Shout out to Dr. Headley, mm-hmm. uh, who is a full professor at Springfield College, and he would always, no matter what. He would always block out an hour for exercise, and if, no, no matter what was going on, that was his time. What did he call it? Sweating, right? It's time he's to like, sweat. It's time to sweat. It's an hour. He doesn't want to be bothered. If there's a meeting, it's too bad. And seeing him prioritize exercise was inspiring. And that in graduate school, it's uh, you know you have the speed wobbles, right? Because it's it's become exercise becomes sporadic, uh, less of a priority in your work, mm-hmm. of course, and your teaching and yeah. etc. becomes a priority, and then you realize like how awful you feel and how the the quality of what you're doing and how you're feeling is much less and yeah it it it, it, it forces you to you know to make the time and i think that's that's important is seeing the value in exercise and seeing what it can do you know and its absence you know of course what it can do as well i think people just feel um i don't know what it is it happens at, at, at the, the academic level, undergraduate, grad, PhD, jobs. Mm-hmm. People carry that with them throughout life. It's this fear. It, I don't want to say fear of missing out, but fear if I don't spend every waking minute per, doing everything I can to prepare myself for the endeavor I'm currently going through, that if I don't get the result that I desire, that that one hour a day of exercise or whatever it may be, watching Netflix. Ideally we want people to exercise, but that somehow that's the reason why you failed. And I could tell you that it's not a linear relationship. It's a parabola where, you know, the normal distribution curve, once you hit the peak of that curve, any additional effort is probably being a detriment to you. And it's not really being as effective as it otherwise could be. So, um, I, I think that we need to, we're sort of in, 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 I think we're waking up a little bit to some of this 
in realizing that it is important for self care and to make sure that uh, we give ourselves time and we're cognitively better for it. And um, yeah, and so I I think that that those are points very well taken. I don't know if you had yeah. anything else you want no, to add Nick, to that. Yeah, definitely. And it, I think going back to what you were saying, Steve, it's build it's more building that sustainable lifestyle, right? So you should probably coordinate things that you're in order to maintain that level of productivity with things that you want to achieve as well, you know? No, uh, 100%. But, uh, and maybe we can, we can touch on this in, in this podcast, but uh, maybe another podcast is that, uh, while the American college of sports medicine, they do have guidelines. It's not, it's, it's not, uh, it, it's, that's not set in stone. You know, it's not as though that, you know, you, you, you have to do 150 minutes. And I, I mean, there was some interesting research that was done. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago that was put out showing that I, I, I could, this could be wrong. Um, certainly fact check me. It was, it's like a minute exercise or six minutes. Uh, that's not including the warm up and cool down, but you're doing one minute or six minutes of high intensity exercise. And that was enough to increase VO to max, which of course is a, um, is an important metric for cardiovascular uh, health. I'm familiar with the concept. The one that I, I thought you were going to bring up was John Jakisic from the University of Pittsburgh came up with the, the, the mark. So for those of you that are listening, the American College of Sports Medicine, that larger flagship organization we talked about earlier, they partnered with Department of Health and Human Services, and it's recommended that people engage in 150 minutes per week of cumulative activity per week. Okay. Um, and what John Jakisic's work did at the University of Pittsburgh was he challenged the paradigm and said, well, does it have to be 30 minutes continuous of activity five days per week, or can I do three 10 minute bouts throughout the same week, totaling 30 minutes per day? And he found that the P value was greater than 0.05, meaning that the people that did 30 minutes per day of activity show no difference in their risk for sudden cardiac death and acute myocardial infarction compared to the people who did um, three 10 minute bouts. So the theory is that even small amounts of activity yield true cardioprotective results. Um, and people don't have to have this all or nothing mindset that I got to get all 30 minutes in or all 150 minutes per, per minute done in one session. So even it's a reference having, point. Yeah. Even having exercise like snack breaks, I believe they, they called it like taking a break from your work and doing high intensity exercise be it climbing stairs or uh running in place or what have you confers health benefits so it's not as though you have to run it's not as though you have to run for 60 minutes is that you, you don't have to run at all right you have to get it in where you could fit it in and you know the modality is really is immaterial so long as that you're you're engaging in you know somewhat strenuous exercise yeah, I think people tend to think of exercise in kind of these confining aspects mm -hmm. where it's hopping on the treadmill for 60 minutes. There's so many different, you know, modalities of cardio, jump rope, swimming, going for a nice walk, you know, um, the physical activity doesn't have to be confined within a gym space either. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many different ways you can incorporate your physical fitness into your daily life. You know, I do think, though, sometimes, again, I, I'm speaking on my own behalf as someone who struggled with weight a lot is that I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, about it doesn't have to be confined to the gym space because for whatever myself, and I think for maybe some others out there that may be listening to this, they think like, if I'm going to lose weight, I need to join the gym. Um, you know, I need to buy fresh new workout gear, new sneakers, <laughs> mm -hmm. right. In order to prepare for that endeavor. Right. Um, and so while that might be a fun thing and give yourself an excuse to buy some of that stuff that makes you feel good and ready for it, I don't know. I, I always found it for myself that I was filling a void that wasn't quite dealing with the root cause of the problem. And so um, you're right. People, I think that it's a myth if people think that they have to join a gym in order to get the benefits that are going to reduce their risk. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Like, uh, I remember, um, yeah, I used to definitely be like that when I was younger too. I would have to wear specific gym clothes in order mm -hmm. to go work out. You know, when I was going through paramedic school and time was kind of the essence, time management, I would just go in with whatever, you know, just regular clothes I had on as long as they weren't je jeans or whatever. 
mm-hmm. and, you know, knock out a couple squats or get on the exercise bike. And, you know, the clothes were dirty anyways. They're going to go in the wash. So why does it matter? You know, um, when I was on Christmas break last year, uh, you know, all the gyms were closed and I wanted to be safe. So I just, I went to um, Home Depot and just bought a couple bags of sand and just started, you know, just started squatting with them and whatever. And, you know, it, it can be way more dynamic than what you, what you can think, you know, physical. And people were strong, like hundreds yeah. of years ago, you know, how did they do that? There was no barbells or dumbbells or anything like that. So, you know, um, thinking more kind of broad in terms of like, how can you get that physical activity in? I think is kind of important too in in terms of allowing yourself that flexibility of getting that physical fitness in if time management's an issue. Yeah. I think these are really important points. I think, you know, that's actually one of the things we we had outlined to talk about on the podcast today. Um, If it's okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about why it's important to exercise. Steve, do you want to tell us why from your perspective, why it's so important for us to exercise and why there have been academic programs uh, created to train people to successfully work in these endeavors. What is it about, why is it important to exercise? Um, so it's important to exercise because as I said before, uh, and as you, is, is I think whoever said the, the pill, the proverbial pill, yeah. is that again, exercise is the most potent non-pharmacological intervention period full stop uh, uh, and again it confers uh, i mean a plethora of, of health benefits cardiovascular um, um, or psychological um, I, I mean i, I can I, I could probably this is a whole other each of those yep uh, it could be um, their own podcast uh, and if people who engage in regular physical activity um, the, uh, the lower mortality rates. Um, uh, I mean, which my goodness, it's, it's, it's so, it's interesting because there's, there's so much and yet yeah. I'm almost it's like, the speak, ul- ultimate preventative it really, medicine, it really yeah. is. If you can, if you were to package everything that exercise could do and put it in a pill, I, everybody in the world would, it would fly off the shelves. I mean, that's, that's how great exercise is. I mean, you're looking for an anti-inflammatory uh, exercise, of course, um, uh, chronic, not not acute, because it, in fact, it has the opposite effect. If you're looking for an antioxidant exercise, we know that it increases endogenous antioxidants, uh, uh, a- a- antioxidant capacity. Uh, again, neurological, cardiovascular, you name it. Yeah, and I think you know the thing that. I teach a lot in the exercise testing and prescription classes. It's cardioprotective benefits, not the likelihood, not only on an absolute case in terms of whether or not people will or will not have a myocardial infarction or a heart attack or that they will die from said heart attack or cardiac event, but also the preliminary factors that many of you or many of your parents or loved ones may be living with you unquestionably know somebody that is a smoker or somebody who is currently living with high blood pressure um, or somebody that is living with diabetes or pre-diabetes, high blood glucose concentrations, somebody who is uh, obese, right? And obese is could be somewhat of a uh, topic of discussion, but generally speaking, we're thinking about people that have more adipose tissue or fat on the person than what is considered normal by um most published guidelines, uh, people that are sedentary and physically inactive and people who naturally have a family history for these types of things. Um, Some of those things, of course, are uncontrollable, but for among the controllable risk factors, being being physically active, which is simply an increase in the body's energy expenditure above resting levels, okay? Or exercise, which has been defined a couple of different ways, Steve and I had a professor in our PhD program that said exercise is a planned deviation from homeostasis. <laughs> and we also had uh, the more traditional definition of exercise, which is a planned type of physical activity that is designed to specifically improve one or more components of health related physical fitness. Those five components are number one, cardiovascular endurance, two, muscular strength, 
three, muscular endurance, four, flexibility, or five, body composition. So the difference really between physical activity and exercise is that physical activity is just things that are going to be done habitually, things that are going to happen throughout your everyday life, going to the grocery store, climbing a flight of stairs. Exercise is a specific subtype of physical activity that is targeted with an intent to improve one or more components of those health-related physical fitness um, variables. And anybody that wants to get go to an exercise science program um, and you have to go for like, I know we did this when I was an undergraduate at Central Connecticut State and you went to the same school. When I went for my professional program interview, they asked me, what are the five health related components of physical fitness? If I didn't get it right, I wasn't getting into the professional program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of, you had to prepare. It wasn't guaranteed just because you had the GPA. So um, I think that's really important because um, physical activity and exercise are not the same thing. They both increase energy expenditure. They have some similarities, but exercise is a very prescriptive programmatic thing that has a target of improving a specific outcome where physical activity is just sort of this uh, step counter of sorts where it's, 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 it's going on in the background. It's keeping tabs of more movement means more energy expenditure, more calories burn that is, but um, it may or may not improve your health related physical fitness. But what we do know is it will lower your risk for sudden cardiac death and acute myocardial infarction, even if it's not specifically exercise. Um, so I, I think those are important things to consider. There's a whole sports performance aspect of this too, mm -hmm. yeah. which have skill related components of physical fitness. Again, those could be probably covered on separate podcasts, but um, I just think that the, the importance of physical activity cannot be understated. And there's typically three waves Okay, that I see one is right people. Well, actually, we're bringing back a lot of we said this before the podcast started. We're bringing back a lot of um, previous professors that we've talked about. And one that we said before the podcast started was Dr. Frangioni. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that he always said to me, I'll never forget this, is that people exercise for three reasons whatever it is it's generally going to fall into one of three buckets fun fear or vanity and i never forget he said that it was a senior level course and he's like yeah people exercise for one of three things they either enjoy it they actually enjoy it they're afraid they're doing it because they want to help their health or they want to look better right and he said that and i remember challenging him and i said these things right here on my list i said well why don't people exercise? Is it not fun? Are they not afraid? Or um, do they not care what they look like? What happens if it's the opposite way? And uh, he said, you know, now he says, Dr. Mike, that was a really good, that was a really good point, you know, but generally speaking, what I have come to learn through some work at uh, Bally Total Fitness, which is where I got my first fitness job, is typically things come down to one of five reasons why people won't exercise. Either they say they don't have the time, they don't want to commit. They don't have the money. Um, they don't have the level of support that they need. Or uh, Nick, you added this in, was knowledge. Um, I can comment on time, commitment, money, and support. Can you talk a little bit about knowledge um, in terms of why you thought that was a, a fifth pillar that's really important? Yeah, I think it's really intimidating for a lot of people who are especially getting into exercise in the beginning. Um, particularly, they don't go into they go into a gym and you know there's a bunch of these machines and they don't know what to do how to do it uh they don't have an overall plan um typically what i see a lot of people doing is they'll build enough motivation to go to the gym once they'll use a, a, a load that's typically way above what they can actually lift they will o either overexert themselves or get injured and then um you know and that's a very demotivating experience you know and um Typically, having that knowledge of what to do and specifically how to do it, I think, is definitely a tool to give people um, the confidence that they need in order to actually work out and get you know healthy cons on a consistent basis. Yeah, and and so at first I I didn't consider knowledge because I was thinking well people know that they should exercise, 
but they don't necessarily do it, right? Like I was in that camp. I knew that I should have exercised, but I didn't do it, right? If I can add something. Um, so I, I agree with you. The people people who who see these this equipment is like these foreign instruments yeah uh, and they you know they, they use too much weight but i also see uh, a lot that people aren't using enough right so they'll jump on the elliptical for 15 minutes and then the, you know they'll put 10 pounds on the chest press and they'll do 10 because everybody hears three sets of 10 okay i think the intensity the knowledge of intensity and what confers the benefits is is what's lacking there as well. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we get stronger? Well, certainly not by doing uh, um, ten pounds on the chest press when you're probably capable of doing eighty or ninety pounds, right? It's yeah. that lack of knowledge. I, I think it goes back into though. That is, I, I guess, I, I disagree with that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely think that um, kind of pushing your limits is not necessarily a necessity, and building strength wouldn't improve health per se. I think. Generally, in the beginning of working out, I would say, from my personal experience, using lighter loads is more important to gain that muscle memory, to get that good form. um, So then when you do plan to exert yourself further, you know how to do it appropriately. And and I'm not going to disagree with you, but my my example was, I mean, there needs to be an appropriate stimulus in order for something to take place. If it's, if, if, if the, is, is, if the intensity isn't, uh, you know, doesn't meet a threshold, then it doesn't, you know, then mm-hmm. doesn't uh, confer the benefit. So I was just simply talking about that. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, I, I certainly agree. You, you do not have to lift heavy at all. You do not have to be a marathon runner. You don't have to do high intensity stuff. I completely agree with you. But uh, as, as someone who had once said, and I forget who, but I'm sure everybody says it everywhere, there has to be a degree of suck. Mm-hmm. Uh, for exercise and that's an unfortunate uh you know an unfortunate uh, uh part of exercise i mean there has to be uh, i mean you know does it mean you can't enjoy it no that's not necessarily true right there has to be there has to be somewhat of a stress a stressful stimulus in order for you to adapt because that's how you get better mm-hmm. is that you right yeah so i think again this comes back to what we were talking about before about physical activity versus um, exercise, mm-hmm. right? Mm. So people may, I guess you can say people can engage with, uh, a resistance training program, which is the example that the two of you were talking about. Mm-hmm. So it's good that the person's doing something. Um, but then, you know, one of the, the, one of the principles that we teach about exercise prescription is, well, there's this principle of progressive overload, right? Mm-hmm. And that in order for someone to get, say, a hypertrophic uh, response or an increase in muscle size, that the load needs to be more than what the body is typically accustomed to, right? So I understand that. Um, I think really what the mission of this podcast that we're, we're trying to do and inform for, again, students, faculty, staff members... Uh, of the university is really well how do you do that right so like you know you should do it we recognize that exercise is a good thing but at the same token like how do i know if i'm lifting at the right threshold Mm -hmm. right how do i know if uh how do i know if i want to if i want to be a power lifter you know like what percentage of weight should i how much weight on an absolute basis what percentage on a relative basis should i be using and really, we hope to be able to answer some of these questions for you, because I'll say that a lot of times these types of things, I think people from the community will look at as like, oh, that's an extra cost that I'm going to have to pay for through a personal trainer to have that kind of expertise. But really, once you know the basic principles and you have the information, really, how do you apply the information to your life, which is really something that I'm interested in. So if it is something like a weight stimulus, the first question I would say is, well, what are your goals, right? What's the primary goal that you have in mind? What's the target? And for some people, it will be they want to improve muscle tone, right? Some people want to increase strength. Some people want to lose weight, right? Resistance training is a tool that can be used to accomplish all of those things. But one of the things you said, Steve, that I liked was that the modification of the intensity and also the frequency 
the duration and the type of resistance training that we're talking about will make a difference in the kind of response you elicit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people that I know, like, uh, from Renaissance periodization, he's trained with me at balance studios is Mike Isretel, Right. And he will say, Mm -hmm. well, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you can, you, you can work the muscle, even if like, for instance, if he was tired and he wanted to work the muscle, a lot of people used a lot of heavy weights. He would say, just work the muscle, which is true. You could work the muscle. You may not work it specifically, the principle of specificity, to the level where you're going to elicit hypertrophic response, um, but you might be improving other parameters, right? So increasing your lean muscle mass, which is good for body composition. So I think that um, a large reason why, to Nick's point, People don't exercise. Some they feel intimidated when they go into this weight room, right? They walk in, they see people that know what they're doing already, and they don't have the confidence to just go and engage with that kind of equipment, right? Yeah. And typically, they're heavier loads too than someone starting out. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so somebody might come in into let's say the DAC, which is the fitness facility on the main campus, right? And and somebody might come in, they walk around. I mean, they might not even know how to get around that place because there's like different different levels have different amenities I mean, there's weight room i mean way at the top floor there's like weight yeah, i think weight, two right? floors are weight room we got an indoor track basketball swimming pool the swimming pool is really tough to get into and mm. it took me a while to figure is that there out a sauna there no right uh i think i don't know that's actually worth looking up interesting yeah, yeah i'm not 100 sure but hmm. we'll check on that um but going into a fitness facility for the first time like it's always going to be nerve wracking if it's your first time doing if you have exercise experience sometimes people value meeting with a fitness professional i've also seen other people myself included when i joined a gym when i first moved to the city where i thought that i didn't need one i was like well i'm already an acsm certified exercise physiologist what more is this person going to possibly be able to show me right i was a little bit ignorant um at that point in time but um But I I do think it's important to provide the resources and the infrastructure to help people understand like why it's important, why you might not be exercising and what you can do about it to do something that you know you should be doing, but you might not necessarily be doing. Mm -hmm. So we had talked about knowledge as one of those pillars. The other couple ones I just want to quickly touch upon, then we'll talk about some of the resources that we have at Drexel. And perhaps um, any concluding remarks that other folks may have is time. One of the biggest concerns that people tell me is I don't have time to exercise. My own mother wants to lose weight sometimes. And she says, well, I uh, I don't have time to do it. I'm too busy. You know, I got too much going on. I'm like, well, none of us are living home anymore. So <laughs> you don't have any of us to take care of anymore. And, um, you know, it, it's are you making an excuse or do you really not have the time? And I don't want to speak for other people's schedules, but I will say that when I was a fitness coach at Bally Total Fitness, it was my job to sell memberships to convince them that they needed to join the gym. Oftentimes, a strategy that I would use is when people would say, oh, I'm worried that I'm not going to have the time to engage in this exercise program. And I would say, really, let's find out. So what I did is I had a stack of calendars at Bally's and I pulled out the weekly calendar and I said, all right, well, What's your, what's your week typically look like? What time do you get up in the morning? What time uh, do you go to work? What time do you get out of work? Are you eating lunch at work? All these different things, building in it. And almost always, I found 16 to 18 hours a week of wasted time. Mm-hmm. That like that all we're asking for is you could still watch Netflix. You can still go on social media. But if you do that five days, right? you would have had all the time you need to engage in an exercise program. And so like showing people that on paper, like I really do have the time. I'm just wasting it. Oftentimes was like enlightening to people and sometimes empowering because it's like, okay, I just need to be better with structuring my calendar and doing what Sam Headley does, which is I'm putting it in to the calendar and it's non-negotiable and that's it. I'll see you in an hour after my sweat's over. So time is one that you can really overcome by what's called calendaring, right? Which is, you know, trying to schedule to the best you can most of your most of your waking hours as much as possible, right? It doesn't have to be perfectly structured, but it needs to it needs to have a little bit of flexibility and you could most often find 
30 minutes to start upwards of 60 minutes to do it. Another one is um, money. People will say, well, I can't afford it, right? And this is going to what Nick talked about earlier. You don't have to have the exercise be confined into um, a gym or a fitness facility, right? So some people would say, well, I don't have money to do this. Okay, it costs $60 is too much. Is it really too much? My question would be, or is it that you just don't see the value for the two months, to, for the $60 a month, right? So um, one of the ways that I would look at this is I would start talking about people's habits, like what they spend. Like I, I was just interested in what they spend their money on. It's, people say, oh, it's none of your business, Mike, of like how I'm spending my money, right? Like we spend money on very bougie coffee that we absolutely love and enjoy. <laughs> that, that It's worth every single cent. It could be worth more than every cent that we charge. Honestly. I agree. It's worth its weight some in of gold. The, yeah, some of those roasts are very good. And, um, and so, but when you start laying it out and be like, oh, well, I eat out twice a week. Uh, you know, I get coffee every morning. It's like, well, you're, I don't say wasting. Cause if you get value out of it, it's really not wasting money, but you're spending two to $300 a month on these frivolous things that maybe if it was really important to you. So I always ask the question, is it really that you can't afford it? Or is it an issue of you just don't value it enough to prioritize it over other things in your life? And that is another barrier that would often happen of why people don't exercise. So time, money, we talked about knowledge. The last two are sort of similar. One is commitment. The other one is support. So uh, to Nick's point earlier, right? Somebody who's joining a gym or going to a fitness facility wants to become more physically active. They might not want to go to a park and walk around the park by themselves, right? They may feel um, the social aspect may be, they may feel foolish walking around exercising. Am I doing this the right way? And so having a buddy is really a useful tool, um, especially if you're both vaccinated. <laughs> Right. If, if you're both vaccinated, you have less to worry about. You can you can walk together. You can have that social experience. But um, the support, right, if you have a buddy that is going to exercise with you, you are more likely to go to that exercise session than if you simply rely on your own self-drive. So if um, you know, I, I'll use Steve again as an example here, but. He and I often have trained jiu-jitsu. Even when we've gone to ACSM conferences, we found a way to train jiu-jitsu together. And like, we're in we're in a town that we don't live in. We don't belong to this school, right? So it's walking into a, a strange place for the first time. And we walked in just as new students. We always made time to do it. We always made time to do it. And it, it would have been easy for me to be like, ah, I think I just want to go back to the hotel and crash. Or I'm going to go to this talk. But like, I knew that because you're my friend, you valued it. And even if I wasn't 100% about it, I would join you just because of my allegiance to your friendship. There's an accountability. You know, when you have friends who are interested in what you're interested in or, you know, uh, there's an accountability there that, you know, in the event uh, you don't want to do it and your other friend wants you, you know, you, you, you kind of feel... As though you're obligated mm -hmm. to do it, you know, and and I mean, ten out of ten times, I had never, never regretted doing it. So if Steve didn't go, though, would you, would you have? Probably not. So do you feel? So it's kind of a level of accountability, but it's at the behest of, in, in your sense, that friend who is essentially more accountable or yeah. more committed than you are. It could work both ways, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a negative side of it would be if we all ordered a pizza and I had dinner earlier. I'm having a couple slices of pizza just because the two of you are eating pizza. That's an unhealthy decision, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I would probably say, ah, I'd, I'd rather hang out with you yeah. than, you know, focus on, okay, well, I'm going to go to jujitsu by myself, right? Yeah. I don't want to pay the mat fee. I don't, I don't want to train with people that are going to smash me, right? Like all these, all these things, right? And so, um, there is something to having that support and a great way of doing it is by having a buddy or a partner with you to go through that process with. Could be somebody, Dr. Salmoninger, Steve Salmoninger can go through this probably some more. 
because he knows all about partners with exercise, whether it's a virtual partner, whether the person is better than you, if the person's the same level than you, he could talk all about that in depth about what motivates people to do it. But, um, and he's also a faculty member in health sciences as well. But that support also is related to the last pillar, which is commitment. So why people will or will not commit to doing the activity. And I think, I don't know what the two of you think, but for me, it's always been that there's some level of doubt that the person has for why they don't want to commit to the program, right? They know it makes sense. You've already addressed their concern that they can afford it. You've already went through their calendar and explained to them that they have the time to make this work. You're providing them with the information and the resources to effectively execute the program. Um, you're going to pair them up. You're suggesting that they give free passes to their buddy, right? You, you're telling them the importance of coming in, but there's just something subliminal that won't let them pull the trigger and do it. Pull the trigger in a good way. I don't mean it in terms of a bad way, but there's one, something there that won't let them say, let's do it. And that's commitment. And why people won't commit to it could be for a variety of reasons that I'm probably not educated to talk about, right? Because um, I think it could be deeply personal. But um, what do you think? I think uh, it was kind of going what Steve was saying earlier, that level of suck that made people not um, – might not be equated to the – how soon the, the the goal that they want to achieve, whether it be body composition, strength, um, and uh, it, it's kind of uneven, right? Um, it's easy for someone who's already strong or already has a deep, um, good enough, decent enough body composition to go to the gym because, you know, they already look good and they just either have to sustain or make minor improvements. But someone from starting out at the beginning who has no idea what they're doing and there's too many unfamiliar things and what they're doing is extremely difficult um, might seem like it's, you know, miles and miles away uh, to achieve their goal. And it's, you know, again, that's kind of intimidating. Piggybacking off of that, I agree. That it, I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not as though, you know, if you're going into lose weight, you exercise for a day, a week, you're not seeing you're not yeah. seeing weight loss. You're not seeing this improvement in in VO two, whatever whatever your you know the reason you're exercising for. You're not seeing. It's not instantaneous. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there might be transient uh, effects, right? This sense of elation or this runner's high, but it's just that it's transient. And, you know, and it can be a grind in the beginning, but it's it's all about you know it's all about getting you know the ball rolling, and then eventually it just becomes habitual, right? It, it just becomes this. This activity that's you know in your day uh, throughout the week, and uh, yeah, but it, again, that commitment, and and I think it's important to address that there are no answers to all of these. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there really aren't different strokes for different folks. And if you can, if you can bridge that gap between knowing and doing, I mean, you'd probably win a Nobel Prize because that's that that that's the golden yeah. nugget right there. Mm -hmm. You know, if there were a surefire way to get people who aren't exercising to exercise, I mean, you're that's yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, I, I feel like it attributes to a, a reason, like a, a lot of reasons why people don't do a lot of things because the I learning agree. curve or the you know what I mean is such a is so steep in the beginning. To we, we like satisfaction, we want to see results, right? Yeah, that's that's the society we live in. Like, I want it, I want it now. Like, I, I mean, I think we're all like that, whether whether we admit it or not, and it's some aspects, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's scary to try new things too. Yeah, it requires like that. I feel like a level of security in order to you know kind of put yourself in that vulnerable position. Yeah, and I, I have to. Uh, I'll mention. I know we have. We only have a few minutes here left. Uh, I don't. I don't particularly care for for his work or. Uh, his his expression but uh action bronson I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with no. him he has a show on um on, oh uh, yes, yeah yes. And on he's vice? Like, yeah he's on, on vice. vice it's like f that's delicious uh and then he's like he's a he's a uh a hip hop uh, uh, artist, which I don't particularly care for his stuff. Side note, but <laughs> I mean, it, it's watching, seeing he was he was extremely morbidly obese. I mean, mm -hmm. I, uncomfortable to watch him move or eat because he was so heavy and like um, he started taking up fitness. And I, I, I mean, 
I I don't I, I don't remember seeing something as motivating as watching Action Bronson pursue fitness. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody who's absolutely determined, and not only determined to go from as heavy as he was as un- and unhealthy as he was to where he's at now, seemingly undeterred. Like yeah. every day was just like I'm getting it in, you know, you know the the very the generic. Oh, it's time to grind, you know. It's a radical blah, blah. lifestyle change. Yeah, I mean, like it's a radical lifestyle change that he embraced, but like at a hundred percent to see somebody like that do what he's doing. I mean, it motivates me. Where did where that come from though? Like what I, was again, what was what was the never again moment? And I think it's the I think what Doctor Frangione said. It's the fear. And I too I, I fall into the all three buckets. Less the vanity because yeah. I, at this point in my life I don't care. But like <laughs> vanity, the I feel the veil, vanity. It's like that was the coattail. Like you yeah. eventually like if you yeah, if think, you do well like you'll it's not you're not gonna look like an Adonis. I mean nobody is. That's 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 a that's an unachievable status. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean you you know you start to look better and feel better but like fear i exercise uh even when i'm not training jujitsu like if i don't have access to an academy to train at i'll run i'll do i lift weights not because i want to get bigger and stronger because i know that i have to because i fear getting older and becoming frail Mm -hmm. so frailty is that fear that i have which which uh is encourages me to to strength train you know what about you mike i I would exercise what was what's that why do you exercise you know, for me, it, it was fear for a while. Um, it what it was fear for a while, and um, it's not fear anymore. <laughs> it's for me now. It's more about thriving, and so I would say it's more for fun. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I picked an activity that is fun for me to engage with, engage with, and I've reaped health benefits from it. Right, like I've yeah. lost weight. Um, it, it's made me have more confidence, right? Definitely. Um, I mean, take someone's back and you put in a rear naked choke and they tap uncle, you know, you feel pretty, um, it, it's a huge, it's, I don't want to say it's an accomplishment cause like, you know, but like you feel like a huge sense of, um, you feel capable pride and you feel empowered. You mm-hmm. feel like I'm empowered. Like, if I was ever on the street and somebody tried to attack me, I would try not to get into the fight, but if sometimes you can't avoid it, um, I feel more confident today by executing this move that I would be able to protect myself. Um, and maybe others, if somebody mm-hmm. else was just, you know, mm-hmm. someone couldn't defend themselves and, yeah. you know, so for me, it, it, it was health originally. I think probably to a certain degree, it'll always be health, but, it's sort of if the pie chart was like 90% health and then 10% fun, meet new people, and then 5% vanity, like I'll, you know, I'll be able That's to buy new clothes. That's 105. Huh? That's 105%. Right? What, is it 105? <laughs> what did I say? 80? <laughs> no, 10, I thought you said 90. You said oh, 90, say right? nine, nine, yeah, 90, 10, we'll 5. We'll play it back. Back. I could be, we'll, I'm we'll tired. We'll play it back. But I, I would just say... Also, that, there's nothing wrong with going on. There's nothing wrong with going on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit it in a post. I, yeah. I always respect feel, that dedication. I always, always felt that um, I, I was an athlete, right? Mm-hmm. Going yeah. back to high school, connecting this whole story back was I was an athlete in high school. I was an athlete when I lost weight the first time. Playing football is a sense of community, right? Jiu-jitsu is a sense of community. I was like, this is the adult version of of my high school football team that I found 20 years later, almost mm-hmm. not almost 20, about 15 years later. Yeah. And to me, that's the thing that stuck. I was sick and t- I, I will lift because it's important to do, but I don't enjoy it. Like I did when I was Same. doing body, bu- when yeah. I was doing bodybuilding and powerlifting in my yeah. college years, I don't enjoy it nearly as much. It's more like, Oh, I got to go do that. The bi- you don't got to convince me to go grab the gi and go roll jujitsu. Yeah. Right, you don't got to talk That's me into fun. it. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. But I don't... before you, because you, you, we, we had kind of spoken about deadlifting, like needing deadlifting, and yeah. tell me when you're done deadlifting after like a good set of deadlifts or squats, like you don't leave the gym feeling like you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like it feels I, good. It yeah. feels unbelievable. Like it's the very when I won't leave jujitsu and when I leave uh, the gym doing deadlifts. If you if you were to put a mirror in front of me and ask me what I look like. I, 10 out of 10 times, I'm like, I look like Arnold right now. No <laughs> doubt about it. It's if you very, put a concrete yeah. wall in front of me, I can walk through it. Like, that's how I feel. It's a very, like, primitive, like, satisfying 
feeling you have yes to kind yeah. of you know yeah definitely um i'd say that's definitely why i work out mm-hmm. right now so when i was younger uh, when i started to work out it was definitely fear not as um terms of health but in terms of just being able to you know get into the military or stuff like that because i wasn't able to get into with my current you know uh, physical capability then when i was um, a little bit older i was kind of working out for vanity so i was you know trying to inc- have a certain body composition stuff like that and uh yeah kind of like you guys were saying as you know as i'm getting older i, I don't really see that as more of a sustainable goal or really the one that kind of coincides with health because i think i took personally to that to an unhealthy level um so now i just kind of do it for the fun yeah strength training feels really good and so does i do a lot of high intensity interval training as well and then when you are um you have a really stressful day like we were talking about earlier i think right before the podcast started mike how when you are kind of are more focused on just being able to breathe and you know just you know kind of getting through that one exercise it really kind of puts a lot of um things that you feel like are stressful into perspective um you know when you're struggling to breathe when you're struggling to get like you know this overwhelming weight off of you uh really kind of yeah pers- puts things in perspective and de-stressing experience I would one thing that you said about getting this weight off of you. The re, so I, I thought a lot about why, and I've had talks with Phil McLaurice about like what is jujitsu? Like it's not a gym, it's not a gym like an exercise program. It's a jujitsu to me is truly a wellness program. It touches almost every domain of wellness. If you let it, you're right. If you let yes. it, right? Yeah. And and like when you have anxiety in your life when if you're a student and you have an exam and you're really like i don't know how i'm gonna get all this done when we're professors and we got like i don't know how i'm gonna get all these grades in right by this mm-hmm. deadline like, like how am i gonna get what's one of what's my one bane that i hate more than anything else with my with work like grading no emails oh my right? god oh, emails, yeah, emails a- to me is <laughs> yeah. that, that is oh, the, that yeah. is the thing that takes i i view emails as it takes up an incredible amount of time i'm getting it's a side note. I'm seeing that now, right? Being a translator. like list, like, like it's. Uh, I don't. Mean, it could even be included as part of the pot. Like it. There's. That's the one thing that I look at. It. It takes up a significant amount of time each day, and I don't feel that it's necessarily being productive. Like I don't have that tangible stack of papers yeah. that I'm getting things done. But for jujitsu, what I've what the biggest thing is when somebody is on top of you, right, and you can't breathe. You don't worry about none of that anymore. You're focused on how do I get this person off me and breathe right now. That and you complete. So it's meditative in a way because every time I step off the mats and I walk home, I'm not worried about emails. I'll get to it as soon as I get home. (laughs) I don't worry about it. Right? I can breathe right now. That's all I care about. I'll be worried about it before I get on the mats. But as soon as I'm on the mat and I start rolling around, once you get that first drill in or you get that first roll in, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It clears it for me. I think maintaining that, like, when it comes to exercise, I don't want to get too much into the weeds because I know we're running close to time, but uh, kind of getting, falling in love with the process of mm-hmm. actual, just the, tr- mm-hmm. the day-to-day training, I feel like, um, and not necessarily focused on that end goal mm-hmm. um, would lead to a more sustainable uh, exercise routine. Yeah, you, I think you nailed it. Yeah, enjoying the process is, is critical. Yeah. Absolutely, because you're not getting to the end goal anytime soon, unfortunately, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, uh, and in, enjoying the process is 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 something that I and I, I, I yeah, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna expound upon this, yeah, but yeah. it's something that would made me enjoy jujitsu more, especially going to this new academy, sure, and getting smashed, yeah, and being like, oh, this is the process. I'm not enjoying like I want it to be somewhere I'm not, yeah, and and refocusing and be like. This is the pro. This is the process. Yeah, everyone has their own niche. That's they just it. gotta find yeah. it. It might not be jujitsu. Um, yeah, I tried it out for a day. Um, I don't know if necessarily was my thing. I think I'll get might get it another go. Um, I'm interested in striking right yeah. now more. I might want to dip my feet into that. But I just like strength training we, we, personally. We should talk about yeah. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just say the one thing that I would just add, and I won't expand upon it too much either. But I think it's. For me, I don't care about when promotions and all that stuff happen, Same. but it's something to look forward to. It's a goal that's coming in the future. It's something to look forward to and gives me something. 
I'm enjoying the process because I'm putting work in that's creating that volume that's going to get me to that higher level yeah. at some point. I don't, right? And so mm-hmm. when I was just lifting weights after I was done powerlifting to lift weights, I was like, I'm lifting, but like, you know, I'm not competing or anything. Like, you know, and so like I needed the why. Like, why am I still doing this? Mm-hmm. That's my brain and why. That's what makes me tick. If I don't have a reason for doing something, I'm just doing it. Like, I didn't want to do a podcast until I had something important to say. And then if this finally came up, serendipitously um but i don't know i think that's that's something to it um i know we're getting close to time nick do you want to talk a little bit about what kind of resources you're aware of at drexel and then anything that i think of that you know you or steve forget and steve can let steve is a newcomer he probably wants to know about all these resources yeah, I, I, I yeah. about um, this drexel is a lot of really good resources that i feel like that as a student is wasn't necessarily advertised to me, and I had to really go out and get it. Um, back even back in 2014, yeah, the the um, the, Dre- the Drexel uh, is it Daskalakis? I might not be pronouncing it as yeah. well, but it's, I think it's called the Daskalakis. Daskalak. Okay, the, yeah, Daskalakis. The, the DAC, the Daskalakis Athletic Center. Yeah, the DAC is um, has a ton of um, equipment. I think they have over. Two, at least two floors of free weights and exercise machines. Uh, they have an indoor track, basketball courts, swimming pool. Um, they have actually on board um, – there they have athletic trainers. And I remember back in like 2014, 2015, I even made an appointment with a nutritionist. And we went over with like my diet program like or my, my diet and, and how much I should eat, what I should eat specifically. Um yeah, there's there's even one that and it's not right open right now, but there's one on the Center City campus as well, right? You used to be it's available for faculty, not student faculty and staff, not students. Gotcha. You have to have uh what's called a castle card for three parkway to get into the basement facility. Not available for students right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, but even as a student you're able to go to the one on thirty fourth, thirty third street, uh for free you just i think you have to sign up it's been so long since i've signed up but when right. you have your drexel card it's for free you know you can sign up you get in uh, no problem oh they even have a what was it what's that new um was it racquetball right yeah racquetball there's also um a wall if you're into climbing. oh yeah rock climbing yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. really fun one, um, one of the students in my lab has a, actually a rock climbing project he's doing a research project on climbing grips and all that so you know, we could talk about that some other time. Maybe I'll have him on this. Yeah, but um, and we're hoping to create some uh, some supplemental material material for this podcast uh, to kind of you know show the whole gym so people can navigate it appropriately, um, mm-hmm. and then hopefully you know develop some more videos based on exercise equipment and you know exactly how to use all the equipment there. So just overall less intimidating and hopefully you know um, kind of break down one of those pillars that might be preventing someone from exercising. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've talked a lot about on this podcast, uh, you know, in terms of like why people exercise risk factors, but really what the purpose of this podcast is not just to talk to you, right? The purpose of the podcast is really to form the bridge between the resources that already exist on campus and to walk with you. So that way you can go from, I know these things exist, but I don't know how to actually implement them and to walk you through the process for, a tour of the DAC that could be a, a video that we put um, out there. Um, this is all content based, but what we really, this podcast will only be successful if you all who are watching it and consuming the information, give us some feedback about what you like and what you want to learn more about. Um, so any type of information, any type of feedback that you have for us is always uh, welcomed and appreciated. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Dr. Vidi, anything else? No, that is it. That's it? That is it for me. I think this is a pretty good start. And I think an hour and 10 minutes, down yeah, 15 minutes. Sounds pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's a digestible amount of time. Yeah. yeah. Nice commute for somebody. Mm-hmm. But um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you all for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If, uh, if you have any other specific comments or suggestions, please feel free to let us know at the email or comment below. And we'll uh, we'll see y'all next time. See ya. Take care. Bye.